Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge of Love of Christ Lutheran Church, and on behalf of Pastor Nanette Christofferson and I, and the Love of Christ Lutheran community, we'd like to welcome you to um, an online look at an upcoming lesson. We're going to look at the gospel reading assigned for Sunday, May 16th, 2021, John chapter 17, verses 6 to 19. We come to our final Sunday in the Easter season. We continue to listen to Jesus, prepare his disciples for his pending death, resurrection, and ascension. To help us look at our gospel reading assigned for this coming Sunday, I'm going to use the material provided by Dr. Mark G. Vitalis Hoffman from United Lutheran Theological Seminary in Gettysburg and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's from the online resource workingpreacher.org offered through Luther Seminary in St. Paul. I offer my thoughts in the parentheses. John consistently uses father language for God, especially in John 17. So it's good to be mindful that this terminology is used to indicate a close familial relationship and not as a gendered identity. Remember, God is not contained with an the confines of a human body, and God created us in God's image, both male and female. So we limit who God the Creator is when we describe God as a man. However, God chose a male, Jesus, to reveal God's nature to the world. John 17, verses 6 to 19, is part of the larger unit of Jesus' last meal with his disciples. It starts in John 13 with the foot washing scene and concludes with Jesus's prayer here in John 17. The prayer is sometimes referred to as Jesus's high priestly prayer, but that's not accurate since Jesus is not portrayed here in a priestly role in John. It comes closer to functioning as John's version of the Lord's prayer with the address to the Holy Father and his name in verse 11, and the request for protection from the evil one in verse 15. The prayer runs from verses 1 through 26. Verses 1 to 25 preceding our gospel reading focus on Jesus' glorification. The text at hand, verses 6 to 19, focuses on Jesus' concerns for the disciples. Verses 20 to 26 close with Jesus' request for his disciples' unity and mutual love. Immediately following the prayer, Jesus and the disciples go across the Kidron Valley to the garden where Judas will betray Jesus. As is typical for Johannian texts, the wording spirals around, seemingly repeating itself, yet moving forward to some new perspective. It is a passage that functions better as a meditative prayer than a spoken text. It's like a fabric woven with repeating words and themes Focusing on a few threads, fo focusing on a few of these threads will help sort out key points in this prayer. The first word is world. The relationship of Jesus and his disciples to the world is complicated in John. The disciples were chosen from the world, verse 6, and in the world, verse 11, and are hated by the world, verse 14, and are not of the world, verses 14 and 16. Jesus prays that the disciples be protected from the evil one who is at work in the world, but not that they be taken out of the world. Verse 15. Ultimately, just as the Father sent Jesus into the world, so too Jesus sends the disciples into the world to continue his mission. World used here is not the planet, but the collection of humanity that due to sin has focused on self at the expense of God and neighbor. The next word is given. This word, didomi, occurs nine times in this passage. It is acknowledged that the Father gave the disciples to Jesus, verses 6 and 9, everything, verse 7, including the words, verse 8, and the word, verse 14, that the Father gave Jesus, Jesus has given to the disciples. The name that the Father gave Jesus is the name which protects the disciples, verses 11 and 12. The next word is word. Jesus is the word, logos, in John chapter 1. 
And so there's a double entendre when Jesus talks about how the Father has given the disciples the word, verse 14, and that this word which they have kept is the truth, verses 6 and 17. God has given disciples both Jesus the word and revealed God's word of truth that sets us free from sin, death, and the evil one. The next word is truth. This section of the prayer is framed by truth, a repeated and significant theme in John, which also has a double entendre. See also John 1, 14, 17, and chapter 8, verse 32, and chapter 18, verses 37 to 38. In John 17, 8, Jesus affirms that the disciples know the truth of his origin with the Father. In verses 17 to 18, Jesus asks that they be sanctified in the truth, which is also confirmed as God's word. All this comes together to confirm what Jesus, the word, had previously said in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. The next word is sanctify. This concept is the climax part of the prayer, verses 17 to 19. The word used, hagiazo, is the same word in the Lord's Prayer traditionally rendered as hallowed. It is noteworthy then to consider that the way in which God's name is to be regarded as sacred is also what Jesus prays for his disciples. Consider also Jesus' statement in John 10, 34 to 36, where his own sanctif sanctification is what qualifies him to be God's son. Similarly, then our sanctification is the basis for our claim to be children of God. This sanctity is not just an abstract reality or the grounds for claiming a godly status. It is described as being in the truth, which is equated with the word, as noted above. And here's where things get interesting. First, the sanctification has a purpose, which is given in verse 18. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. That is, sanctification is not a way of being made pure and holy by being set apart. It is intended as a way for the disciples to be sent forth to share the small t, large t, capital T, truth, and the small w, capital W, word. It is not a way of being taken out of the world, but being sent into it. Jesus provides a similar commission in John 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Second, verse 19 points to how the sanctification occurs by connecting our sanctification with Jesus's. What does it mean for Jesus to sanctify himself? I believe that I must refer to his action of laying down his life on the cross and taking it up again in his resurrection. Jesus makes this reference in John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. What then does it mean for us to be sanctified in the small t, capital T, truth? We can return to Jesus' own words earlier in this discourse at the last meal in John chapter 15, verses 11 to 13. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life, for one friend, for one's friends. Our sanctification, therefore, comes freely to us at the cost of God in Christ. But it is not cheap grace. It also comes in the experience of losing our own lives, as Jesus noted in John chapter 12, verse 25. Those who love their life lose it. 
But those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. As with John in general, this passion, pa passage functions on two levels. The prayer Jesus shared with his disciples around 30 CE and the ongoing relevance of that prayer for Jesus' disciples later in the first century when the text was written and shared in the Johannian community. This perspective becomes explicit in verses 20 to 23, which is not included in our gospel reading for Sunday. In those verses, Jesus refers to those who will come to believe based on the original disciples' testimony. Here's that passage. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This latter context also serves to make John transparent and applicable to Jesus' disciples today. For the first disciples and for us, Sanctification in the small and capital truth and the small and capital word, therefore, is both a matter of what God does for us in Christ and what we experience in being sent into the world as messengers of that word and as disciples who love one another, even to the point of laying down our lives. So I end with a couple of questions. What difference does it make to you that the gift of faith that you possess is in direct response to the prayer that Jesus prayed so long ago? Why might it be important for us to remember that Jesus continues to pray for his followers to continue to be sent with the good news of the word of God and the truth that challenges the competing words and truths protect, projected in the current world. As you ponder these questions, as you read over this text, may God bless you on the journey of loving one another and working with all disciples to be one in Christ. God bless.